what Evan, what do you, what is your take on the initial, all this stuff with NIL? Um, <clears throat> I think it's really cool for the college athletes to be able to access the dollar bill. Um, you know, thinking back when I was playing, uh, we got, I think it was like a thousand dollars a month. It was like just the COA, the cost of attendance, something yeah. like that. And, you know, we couldn't do some of the things outside of just the regular life that, you know, maybe some other people that were working could. Um, so it allows people, um, allows college athletes to gain that part of life, right? Being <laughs> able to go hang out with their friends and go downtown and do whatever and be able to spend money and not have to worry about, you know. So how much, bucks. how much money did you say you got? I think it was like a thousand a month, something like that. It was, and everything was paid for, but we, we had that. Did I, you, was your rent included in that? Um, man, that's a great question. I don't remember. Our stipend was like eighteen hundred, I think. A month. Yeah, like fifteen hundred. Was that, was your that was included, your that it, didn't, it, it didn't it didn't include rent or anything like that, or that was like for rent. Oh, we, we 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 didn't have housing paid for. Because you could live off campus after your first yeah, year. Yeah, maybe mine was a thousand and rent wasn't paid for, but I lived in a house. I spent like four hundred dollars a month on rent. Yeah. So ours might have been closer to fifteen hundred, but it was something it was a little over a grand though. Because yeah. we had I want to say rent was seven. We got a check for seven fifty and then our cost of attendance was four twenty. I'll never forget that. As That's long as I live it. So yeah, that would have been just at twelve hundred a month. I remember actually. So I broke my collarbone going into my senior year. Muschamp had just gotten hired, and this was our this is the middle of spring balls, our second scrimmage, and um, we uh, the the week before Lorenzo Nunez sprained his knee in the second scrimmage. I remember it was like a cold, rainy day. <clears throat> I walked in and I thought for sure I was like, all right, there's no way we're gonna be live, like. I don't think I had been live in a scrimmage since maybe middle school, right? At quarterback. And he said, he was like, all right, quarterbacks are live. And I looked at coach Roper. I was at the time. I was like, really? Like, are you serious? I'm like, being a pussy. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, man, Lock I, in. it wasn't even a big hit. I, he just fell on me like the weirdest fall, like it, on the film, you would never expect it, but I heard it crack and I put my arm right, right on my collar. And I felt it was like this. Yeah, and, and I jogged off the field, and, and Coach Muschamp knew. Like it was like you know that meme. It was like, and at that moment, you knew you effed up. And yeah. that was, he was like, he felt so bad. He came to the hospital the next day. Like he's awesome, um, but he uh, he felt so bad. My parents were so mad. Hell, I was mad. I remember I called my mom and my dad. I was like, Hell hey, don't yeah. freak out. I'm okay. But I broke my collarbone. It was a complete break. It'll yeah. be like, I'll be out four to five weeks. Like, and I really was, it was like six weeks. I <laughs> play. Um, but they put that being, like a plate and screws in it. Yeah. Yep. In this one. You yep, still, you still got it. Yep. Sits on top. Um, but all to the reason I even share that story was, um, I was over, um, I had to stay for May to rehab. Cause that was like the latter part of March when I broke it. <clears throat> and um i think i got like a thousand dollars plus my rent paid for and so nice. dude i was living large i went out and bought <laughs> shoes like five new t-shirts yeah. i was like wow i'm balling right now <laughs> thought i was in high cotton yeah yeah that extra money is sweet but i mean it i think that so i talk to quarterbacks now currently in high school and they think everybody's getting paid like big time and that's just not the case um yeah and so, you know, it's really cool how some colleges are doing it to where they're they're allotting money for um, almost all the starters to be able to get something. Um, yeah. And uh, that's really a cool way to kind of build some kind of camaraderie, of course, that there's a quarterback that's probably making the most or whatever, um, different levels, right? South Alabama guy's not making probably as much as the Alabama quarterback, but they're still having some kind of, you know, um, some kind of NIL money coming in. Um you know, it's a, it's a cool feature for sure. Yeah, something local. Um, so what do you think with, and then Patrick, I'll ask you this combination of transfer portal NIL all at one time. 
Um, I think it's caused an absolute disaster in college football with the combination of two at once. Um, I think that it's really, I personally believe that it's powerful and it's great to give kids the opportunity that might not be playing at their present school. Um, and then it allows them to, you know, make that quick transition to go and land at a school. But, you know, you see all the time of look at the Dylan Gabriel kid. And I don't know the kid from Adam, right. But he's a good football player, but you know, he's gone from UCF played well, went to Oklahoma, played well. And now I think he's going, is it Southern Cal? Oregon. 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 Yeah. Okay. Oh, he transferred to Oregon. I didn't even know that. Yeah. yeah. He grabbed a bag, I'm sure. Oh, oh yeah. And then, so he grabs a bag and, and, you know, I was in, in a group text just a few moments ago and we were talking about, you know, if you believe in capitalism, like where's the issue there now? That's what you know, I, the, there's there there's a there's a fine line of loyalty and you know getting what's you know yours and I think there's a lot that goes into it. So I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. I think it's interesting in the realm of college football because it is such a team sport and you grow over years and like just like learning a system the camaraderie that you have with your teammates earning respect and trust and that there's something to say about doing that for three to four years somewhere i've always been like i was going to say like for capitalism like where if you have a an opportunity to go somewhere else to be around a coach that's better fitting for you or around a better atmosphere like i left i'd transfer schools because it wasn't the right fit and the portal wasn't the portal wasn't around then but i still had the opportunity to transfer and go to a different school but had i been stuck it might not have panned out the way i wanted it to i don't like the way money has played such a role in the transfer portal now and just recruiting in general um my buddy nolan who is a ga at uh clemson now like he's told me stories and things he's heard of people parents like for these junior kids that are juniors come on junior days whether it's at clemson or any other school like are expecting like hey wh- how much money are they gonna be making like when they come in here and like that just never was a thought like coming out of high school it's like man i just want to go play college football i want to be on a team somewhere i just want to have that last name on the back of my jersey because like you've never had it before yeah. and so it's just take it's just taking a huge spin and i feel like and i've, I've heard you know murmurs of different things of the way they can kind of get somewhat of a control over things. I feel like making the players like employees of the school, paying them a certain amount. I think it should be like pretty standard. Like you got 85 scholarship guys. Those guys are all getting stipend. I think if, if all these collectives are pouring in, you make it similar than you do almost like how professional teams do with cap space and then bonuses based off of performance. Like how can you tell a five-star guy? Yeah, man, you come here you're going to make 500 grand, but then he gets hurt or he decides to sit out of X amount of games. Like I think there needs to be certain thresholds and incentives for these players to go hit. Like, I think that'd be super cool because it is based off performance. And that's like one thing that's happened right now. There's so much guaranteed money. Like, Hey, you come here, we'll get you a new truck with the dealership that we got a partnership up the road. We'll get you free housing. We'll get you a million dollars from one of our collectives. Or if that kid shows up and can't play, and now you got the, the investors and boosters that are pissed off. Like, man, you went and recruited this guy that couldn't play worth a lick. Like, that's where my money went. But it's like, if you put some incentives in place and manage the money like NFL teams do, then I think it's a little bit more manageable. But right now, it's just a complete cluster. But I, I don't like the way that money has played a role in a lot of kids making decisions because some people get fortunate and, um, it turns out to be some of the best decisions they've ever made. And then some people get, whether it's internal pressure from family or friends or their head coach back home um, to go on a leap, to enter the portal when they really shouldn't like, and, and I, and I feel like most coaches are honest. Again, I had, I was fortunate enough to play around uh, or be coached by great coaches and an organization that really cared about you. But the the honesty that you got to have from the coaches Mm-hmm. to the players is so important too like we i mean i would hear stories of i was like hey you're a developmental guy like you're going to be a you're going to be a three-year guy and then possibly start <laughs> like it's going to take time to get there but then so many people just want to jump ship super quick to go see and hope the grass is greener 
they end up getting stuck somewhere, don't have the grades that cut it. And the next thing you know, they popped around at three schools and don't have a degree when they get out. And that's fine. But when you, you if you rack up a hundred grand in three years, like that's fine for the time being, but now you don't have a degree. And if you don't have the wisdom and support of what you're doing with that money financially, then you put yourself in a burden and lose it like that. People don't yeah. realize how quick a hundred grand can go, especially Dude. if you have, have zero structure, <laughs> zero budget, and you're just kind of, a college kid like dude if i had a hundred grand in college there's no telling the type of crap i'd be spending it on like <laughs> i mean i'd ask for support from like my parents and hopefully would be smart with where we were going with it but i mean i'd probably take half of that just to go screw around so I, i'd like it's, it's funny hearing Saban make all the comments he's been making about it of you know it's one of the big reasons why he got out of it because the priorities have switched like people don't you, I know how much I grew as a person over my four years and you couldn't put a dollar amount to that. And like, yeah. had I bounced around to go try to make a buck here and there. And that was like the one thing I know I'm going off on a tangent here, but like I had, I had so many injuries and surgeries from football and like was on scout team our first couple of years and finally made the travel team. And I remember I wanted to quit so bad after my first ACL tear and then wanted to quit so bad after my ankle reconstruction. But I kept on telling myself, like, you know, grind hard for four years, and this is going to pay off 40 years down the road. And I'm yep. so glad I did looking back on it because of the, the person I became during this four years when money wasn't even a focus. It was just not quitting. But, like, had I jumped around to try to go play somewhere else or make some money, I wouldn't have learned everything that I learned, would have become the person that I became, wouldn't be on the professional track that I'm on now had I gone and done something. So I feel like it's, it's taking a lot of the commitment and grind out yeah. of play. And it's like, how can we, how can I blow up my Instagram following? How can I make more money? Like people are just so superficial right now. And it's no knock on anybody individually. It's just the way the world's changed. So yeah, I'd and love to see it change in some manner, but you know, yeah, no, that's a great point. Evan, what, do you, what about you? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, kind of bouncing off, you i'm thinking more of like the transfer part right i you know you look at a guy it works out like for bo nix bo nix was in kind of a bad situation at auburn one to want to make a change goes to oregon plays for a great coach and uh, he was super successful you know but he was like the face of oregon he played in the bowl game was excited never was a thought to not play in the bowl game which you don't see anymore um and so you got that guy and then you got a guy maybe like, you know, I'm not ripping on him, but maybe like DJ uh, Uliangale from Clemson who went to Oregon State and now he's at Florida State. I don't know people's stories, but from the outside looking in, it looks like you're hopping around for whatever reason. Maybe it's not a good situation, but, you know, you would think that after one decision, you would probably try to stick at a, at a place, right? You would try to make sure that you stick. Side note, that will be one of the most viewed regular season games in college football this coming fall. 100%. Yeah. And and nothing against the kid. I don't know the story. He probably, you know, maybe something happened or whatever at Oregon State, so we want to make the change. Um, but at the end of the day, like, I believe that, you know, I could have maybe transferred after not playing for a few years, and I made the decision to stay. And, man, the friendships I had over that four years that I created – at South Alabama, like the people that just in the city that I got to uh, build relationships with um, was amazing and it was life changing. And uh, if I would have bounced around, I've never been like planted my roots and and grew there, you know. Um, and so I'm super thankful for that. But once again, transfer portals can be really good. But once you start bouncing around, you know, I look at look at Breeze, my son, when he's when he's going to school. Am I going to be like, hey, man, uh, Oregon's paying you a million dollars to go play there. Am I going to tell him no? Like when he says yeah. no, I'm be like, I mean, you that's life changing money. Like go do yeah. what you need to do. You know, um, so I don't fault, you know, the uh, Oklahoma's quarterback for for transferring if that's the case. But at the end of the day, you do want to build some camaraderie. And, you know, Tim Tebow talks about it all the time. It's so different. Um, it was always about like the the name on the front of the chest, right? Um, and who you played for and building that team. But at the end of the day, that's the world we're living in. I think a big excuse that I, and it's not just an excuse. I'll, I'll just hit on the DJ point. Like I know his head coach left Oregon state and he wanted, yeah. and, and they didn't have a 
you're not really going to have a Pac-12 conference because that's all shaky or whatever. So that's I understand that a little bit. But I feel like and I don't remember this being a thing several years ago. Like there's always coaching changes and transitions, but I feel like coordinators and even head coaches are leaving like left and right. Like I know like Dylan, Dylan Gabriel, one of his excuses or reasons for leaving Oklahoma was uh, Lebby, the offensive coordinator it's who he had, like, yeah, that recruited him, that got him there and was a big part of him coming to Oklahoma. He left. And so he's like, Oh, my OC left. Like, well, I'm going to go somewhere else now, too. Because yeah. I feel like that, like the whole coaching change is yeah. another reason for kids to leave. And so I don't know if it's that's just become a more valid reason for kids to be leaving or if it's a bigger thing now in the coaching realm of, of coaches. Up and I, have a, I have a couple things I want to share. I'm glad I got your guys' opinion on it. Have you guys heard much about this Caden Proctor situation at Alabama? Mm-mm. Off of yeah. lineman? No, no. Okay, so you use. I'm glad you brought up Bo Nix because there is some really good things at the NIL and the portal, and you get yeah. kids able to make life changing money. And I saw the other day that um, Travis, um, uh, my goodness, the the big time corner at Colorado, oh, Hunter. Uh, Travis Hunter, yeah, Travis Hunter went and bought his mom a house with his NIL money, just like really, really awesome stuff. Yeah, yeah. and you have guys like this Caden Proctor dude <clears throat> was. Uh, from Iowa was going to commit to Iowa, leverage the commitment from Iowa to go and get the bag from Alabama, played at Alabama this past year, hits the portal, goes and gets the bag at Iowa, and then runs back to get the bag at Alabama. He was at Iowa for two and a half months, so he left after the Michigan game, was there January, February, uh, and just hit spring ball. Now is back at Alabama for spring ball. I don't like that. And that's where that's the the horror stories of this ha- ha- comes into play. And you know, I was talking with an employment um, attorney on Thursday when we were watching the Gamecocks basketball game, and he was talking about he believes that uh, in the foreseeable future, he doesn't believe that the universities will ever label their student athletes as employees. He just doesn't uh. think they'll do it. The problem that I see with that is you're going to have to, um, and I think, you know, you've had Nick Saban last week going in and talking to Congress about the changes that need to be made from an NIL standpoint when you're getting the judicial system involved. Anytime you get the government involved, it's never good, in my opinion. Um, But uh, that's a conversation for a different day. I think you guys could probably see where we align. This guy loves capitalism. I hate government. I think you see see where we fall here. but. Um, if you don't put salary cap for teams and some type of agreement, some type of contract, even as a 1099 yeah. agreement, um, you, you've got to put some guardrails on it. But you see guys like Chip Kelly going from being head coaches to coordinators. You see guys from college to the NFL. You see guys leaving college to go to high school. They just don't want to be a part of it because you're not even coaching anymore. You're literally managing people. And so the reason that you got into the sport overall was to be a part of the team, be a part of the game. But now as you're running a business, I mean, you're yeah. literally just trying to retain employees. You know, if I was in a situation like a Dylan Gabriel, you know, like I, I remember how much I cared about South Carolina going into my last year. And if, you know, I was somebody with the stature of one of these other better players and, you know, a school had reached out to me or my parents or somebody I knew or whatever. And was like, hey, I have a quarter of a million dollars waiting for Perry over here at wherever. Um, my first inclination would be like would go to the coaches at South Carolina and say like, Hey, this is what they're offering me. Um, you know, not for like, you know, 10 grand or even probably 50 grand, but something of substance, right. A a six figure offer. Um, I would see how close could we get to that? I just, you know, there's something to be said for loyalty, you know, and and I know a lot of these, uh, people are bigger names, but I look at my own personal life and what I've been able to do from a professional career springboarding from college football into my next phase of life utilizing relationships that are here in south carolina that are like hey you know obviously you weren't an all-american you weren't an all-conference player but you played hard you kept your nose clean and now we want to 
help you in your next phase of life. We want to find a way to do business with you. We want to X, Y, and Z. So it springboarded me into, like you said, Patrick, the next phase of life to better, um, you know, really better prepare you for the next 40. And I think that's what kids are missing. You know, then the next thing that I transition to is if you start talking, okay, you get a hundred thousand dollars of an NIL money, uh, of some type of an NIL deal. Well, typically you're going to have an agent, some type of an agent that helped align that. So right there off the bat, they're probably getting three to 5%. Then because you've collected a hundred thousand dollars, you're that's taxable income. You can't just Nah, it's hundred cash. So there's twenty percent off the rip. Okay, so you've got five percent down, so that's five thousand gone. Now you've got twenty-two percent gone, so now you're down twenty-seven. So now you're really at seventy-three thousand. Okay, mm-hmm. how fast do you think these kids can burn through seventy-three thousand dollars with no hesitation? Yeah, if they're they're not smart enough, and their their camps are not smart enough. They're going to go and buy a $60,000 Dodge Charger, okay? And then next thing you know, you've got $13,000 left over, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then you're, hey, you're, you're one, one night at the bar that your your tab is on there, that's that's five grand right there, 10 grand. You tell yeah. me, what are your teammates driving? Dude, half our team was driving Dodge No, no, you, no you're, you're just so spot. I was just... It was hilarious. It is so no, but, Yeah. No, I mean, that's exactly what's happening. Or and a new got truck spring, or you got whatever. Spring, I mean, you got, and you and got you spring got... break coming up, and, and guys are going to South Beach, Dude, bro, getting bottle service tax, and hotel rooms. Agent fee, new car, spring break. You guys watched your Johnny Manziel. Uh, that sh- Money's Netflix gone, brother. Documentary. <laughs> yeah. He burned through that in like a weekend. Money yeah, that's what money. I, that's literally what I would have been doing. If I had that money, I would have been a disaster. Yeah, disaster. And I know some of these colleges are setting up things to like financial advising and all this stuff, but at the rate that it's going, I don't know if they have enough personnel to really handle how much it's getting out of control. I don't know what they're doing at some of uh, you know, some of these other schools out there. I know South Carolina has hired individuals simply to help navigate the NIL process, right? They have a financial advisor who is a former player come and talk to the team about, hey, you make a hundred thousand dollars. If you don't touch that and you give it and put it here, over the next 40 years, at the end of your 40 years, this is what we can project it's gonna land to based off of the previous 40 years. Kids realize like, wow, that's pretty daggone impressive right well you know some kids do that some kids don't it's yeah just i mean a, it's just not an immediate thought how much yeah, how just, much if you like seriously patrick if you had 40 grand just say 40 or 50 grand and you just got it as you saw it in your bank account and some guy was talking bye to bye. you about throwing it into some roth ira or some whatever <laughs> That's going to make you this 40 years from now. You're like, my boys just said we're going out tonight. I don't know about you. Like, yeah, I, I would, I would, my mindset would be, I'm going to use this to have fun over the next, my, my time in college because I'm going to make money after school. That would be my immediate thought. Yeah. I'll make it to the league or I'm going to make money after. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like that's that, the thing too, is so many people, I mean, and I'm glad everybody dreams big about the NFL, but, and I know all these players here, you know, the small percentage of guys that first off make a team and then make it to year four to actually get paid. A lot of people don't think about that. You really don't get, I mean, you can make a lot of money in a couple of years, but you're really not getting a big contract until year four. Dude, but that, uh, four years goes by like that. I mean, we know that, but, people aren't thinking about setting themselves up for success later down the road. It's all about right now and having fun, which again, I would want to be doing the same thing too. Right. What are some of the other better you brought up Bo Nix? I mean, what are some of the other better transfer portal stories? Like one that comes to mind just because you're talking Bo Nix in Oregon would be Michael Pettix Jr. at Washington goes from Indiana for ACL surgeries and then goes out in sets the freaking world on fire at washington mm-hmm. yeah. um, i mean heck and then you go to the playoff a great game. move 
yeah, they played yeah. Texas. And you look at uh, Quinn Ewers, who I'm a huge fan of Quinn. I think he is yeah. phenomenal. He listening to his personal story, talking about how he, you know, number one quarterback in the country goes to Ohio State, big hot shot, you know, blah, 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 and kind of gets humbled a little bit, comes back to Texas, still kind of has that hot shot mentality, and then really, you know, breaks his collarbone against Alabama. Really, really struggled in the 22 season. Basically sat down going in the offseason and said, like, I, I'm – I've had enough. Like I'm getting to my game. Like I'm going to lock in and I'm going to focus and I'm going to take my game to the next level. Yeah. Dude was immaculate this past season. I mean, they stellar. I mean, yeah, yeah. It, One of the best yeah, teams in the country. If 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 they don't, if Texas had, I mean, they were 12 yards away from winning that game. But if Texas has a pulse on defense that night, um, I think Texas plays Michigan better. Now I will battle that georgia was still the best team in the country um that year but you know alabama found a way to beat them and then they beat the ever loving breaks off of a you know second and third florida state team there but kind of crazy what what were some of the other better stories i'll brag on my boy uh chase bryce um when we were at clemson he was yes. uh, yeah he was four third four string guy freshman year was a third string guy going to the season in 18 and Kelly left. So we served back up in 18, um, back up in 19. He stayed, he stayed through the 19 year to finish his, um, bachelor. So he got his degree from Clemson in three years. And so that gave him the opportunity to go then transfer at the time. And so then he went to Duke. He had several offers after transferring goes to Duke has a bad experience there. And this is like when the portal first became a thing, really goes to Duke, they go like three and eight or something. Um, doesn't really fit the system. Well, doesn't really pan out. And then he hits the portal and then goes to app state and then absolutely tears it up at app two he years. Did. I mean, bought out. And yeah. then, you know, now he's in playing the Canadian football league, but I feel like he did it the right way by staying around through Clemson, getting his degree which was a huge priority for him and did it in three years, got his degree, transferred, wasn't good fit, and then transferred again to now at a, was at a school where, again, he met some of his very, very best friends and had a tight-knit group of guys at App and had a lot of success, and he got to actually play and freaking tear it up. So Played well, too. Dude. Yeah, and, it, yeah. and well. I, would, I would even take a step back, even like look at I, – I, didn't he play really well when he got in the game at Clemson, too? Yeah, he bought, so man. Yeah, yeah, in 2018, he when so it was the week that Kelly left, and Trevor was the starter. Gets concussed in like the second quarter or something like yeah. that. Yeah, base comes in. We're down by like 17 in the game, and just duked it out. Travis it had a huge route. game. Yeah, but yeah, we had a, was, seven. Yeah, threw a dime to T, caught it, drove down the field go up with a touchdown and then our defense seals them and like oh, that kept awful. our season that kept our season alive and we went on to go with a natty and then in 2019 we we're just blowing teams out chase would come in the second half and light it up too yeah man that's awesome i mean just shows you like the dude was ready to play yeah. you know, dude was ready to play and then you know some things happen want to go be the guy obviously sitting behind trevor is is a tough deal um, trevor was okay yeah. yeah he was okay in college so yeah. But again, and we talked about that when and I'm excited to see the modules once it all caught, comes out when we were sitting around talking about like being a backup and how important that is and how it's one of the toughest positions in sports. Like had he not taken that seriously and prepared, he would, I mean, he was a third string guy going into that game. Wow. And then yeah, ends up Monday. playing the, and ends up, ends up playing like two or three quarters in that game and goes and wins and then serves in backup all of 2019. But he, if he wasn't focused and locked in, Again, he wouldn't have had the stats or the film to even have Duke or some other Power Five schools want him to come and play. And so I think it just goes to the importance of taking everything seriously and that like you are one snap away from being thrown in. Yeah. What are what are some things that I guess now looking at high school quarterbacks, like how can we help high school quarterbacks like talk through with them about um, their journeys to make it to the collegiate level with the transfer portal going on. Um, I know that, you know, everybody's like, well, nobody's recruiting high school guys. I, I would say that they still are, um, but yep. they, uh, 
you know, it is a different kind of story. It might be a little bit longer process, a little bit more of a waiting game. But uh, but what do you guys think of that? Yeah, I know. No. Patrick, I'll let you go first, though, brother. You got it. Go ahead. Um, yeah, it, it, it's completely different. Um, you know, you used to see colleges take two guys, sometimes two, definitely one every year. Um, and for the most part, most are still are, are doing it. Um, you know, it's just harder now. It's harder because, you know, with the, we're still seeing some remnants from the COVID year of people that were freshmen those years. So that extended year, like I have a quarterback that I train who's at Elon right now, and they have a quarterback coming back to start going on his seventh year of college. And uh, I mean, he was probably Patrick. He was probably in your graduating class if the math adds up. Right. I mean, so he, um, you know, that that's a struggle because that that's eating up the scholarship. But it's like, you know, as Elon, do you take a seventh year guy that's played big time D1 ball that transferred down? Or do you want to take a risk on the high school kid coming from some small school in Columbia, South Carolina? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I see both sides of it. Um, but what high school kids need to do is it really begins um, in the eighth grade, honestly. Um, for me, at least, I wish that if somebody would have sat me down in the beginning of eighth grade and like everything you do, do now is going to eventually help you come the sophomore, junior, senior year of getting recruited, getting in front of people and making sure that like ultimately like everything you're doing now is building up for those Friday nights and not to get mm-hmm. to those Friday nights and have all this pressure. But it's, you know, everything has to be moving towards that because You know, I know people don't like to say, you know, specialize. They like to say play the different sports, which I get it. I'm all for the different sports and playing, but it's a competitive world out there. And if you don't just have the natural God-given ability, like people like to point out, well, Kyler Murray played both sports. How many (laughs) dudes out there are like Kyler Murray? Kyler Murray is regarded as the best high school football player ever in the state of Texas, right? How many Russell Wilsons are there? Like for the majority of us, they're a lot like us. Like we're going to have to really specialize in what we do yeah. to maximize our our ability. Now, I'm not saying that you can't go and play baseball or basketball or whatever, but when push comes to shove, like everything you should be doing should be ultimately helping drive you to your goal. That's right. 100%. 100%. I think it's weird. Not, I don't know if you – I know you um, – obviously coaching at a high school, you probably got a good experience of it. I've heard that I feel like the recruiting world in college to high school athletes has gotten super political in a way where schools are even offering, giving offers that aren't even committable. No, they are every most, most, I shouldn't say every, but 95% of schools are offering kids that are not committable. It's literally like, the weirdest it's the it's, it's mind boggling to me like they have to check a box or they want to get this kid exposure see if these other schools offer or then they'll make like it's like for for me when i was coming out like i didn't have a lot of offers and i was all the coaches were very honest and i i appreciate it during the time but they're like hey man you're the number two or number three guy on our board right now and we have offers out to these these one or two other kids and we're waiting to hear back from what they do like and if they decide to commit um somewhere else then like you'll be the first guy but i feel like like now they're just tossing these offers out to kids yeah. and then kids get in a bond closer to the day they're like well i have this offer but i can't it's not a scholarship or i can't commit to it or they'll come back to them like yeah well you can come on as a preferred walk-on now like it's just really weird because like, they're, they're trying to see what's going to happen in the portal and if they can yeah. get a quarterback that's kind of like well we want you to know it's out there we like you here's a offer whatever that means they, but we gotta we gotta figure out our roster stuff until the end of the season it's like quarterbacks no, like, have to ask the specific question to the coach and say hey is this a committable offer like i've had to do that with some of our guys like talking to coaches is this a committable offer or is this just fluff and it, yeah. like why are we even doing that it's stupid i hate it but yeah i think it you nailed it on the head and this is what i advise my quarterbacks and this is what I would advise my son or Breeze, Evan's son. If the world and the environment of college football is the exact same now as it is in, you know, 
17 year eight or 16 15 16 years when breeze is coming up you know the goal is to understand who who has a committable what's the committable offer who's extended that to you and then when you get that first committable offer you've got the most six months before you need to make a decision Mm -hmm. because you need to secure your spot how many times i mean it happened with one of the kids he wasn't a quarterback he was playing for me though running back receiver hybrid guy ultra talented kid um had a non-committable offer to middle tennessee state we thought it was going to be committable the coach said a couple weeks it'll be committable and then we never heard from him again like wouldn't respond like just so twisted well anyway by the grace of God, somebody came in late and gave him an offer and got it handled. But if you wait to get that perfect school, you're going to be left with your shirt off and on the outside looking in. And so what I advise my kids is get the offer, give it a couple months, go visit right? the school, go visit the school, go to a camp, go to, you know, go. If you get an offer in the summer, like you need to be there at the first game in the fall. If you get an offer in the spring, you need to be at a practice, you need to be at the spring game. You need to be showing attention to people that are showing attention to you, especially mm-hmm. now because, you know, you go to Elon, go to school like Elon, get your butt on the field. You want to go play at Wake Forest, you want to go play at NC State, get your butt on the field and go throw for 3,000 yards at Elon. And those schools will come and get you, right? And I hate to even say that because I, 30 minutes ago, I was talking about having loyalty and X, Y, and Z and whatever. But, you know, if that's your goal and your aspirations is to get to that level because you believe in your heart of hearts that you can play there, that that's the, that's the way to go. Because the walk-on route is, that is, that is a hard route, man. And you got to have the right coach. You know, I was very fortunate that, Spurrier didn't care for a second that anybody walked on. And that was his MO from the time he was at Duke. But not everybody gets that situation. And then the reason that I got to play when Coach Muschamp came in was because I had 12 games of film where they could watch and say, okay, well, I mean, he's played in the games. So at least he's, you know, he could play, right? Mm-hmm. Versus, you know, if, I would have been a walk-on that was granted a scholarship, but never really got a chance to play. When Coach Muschamp's staff would have come in, I, I, I don't, I don't think I would have played. And some people they just look at walk-ons differently than others. And doing the PWO route, um, you guys know how big of a grind college football is. If you think you're just going to want to wear, you know, run around and just wear the jersey so you can pound your chest, you're going to hate your life. It's not sweet. Fun. No, no, it's not fun. But like, you know, you look at your situation, like you had a passion to be a Clemson Tiger. You still love the game. You had your own unique role to help the team win a friggin' national title. Yeah. You know, like, yeah, you didn't play, but you had the number one overall pick as a starting quarterback. If Trevor Lawrence was at South Carolina, I wouldn't have played either. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, I mean, phenomenal experience. But to your point, I mean, still want to quit. Like, yeah. Yeah. Because it's such a, it's like, it's, it's tough playing college football. You have to love it. Like, and I mean, really, really, really love it. Every yep. little element of it. And then taking the walk on approach is an even more dedicated love to the game. Mm-hmm. And talk about staring in the face of no results and grinding and trying to find little ways to get better and make a difference. I mean, that's, it's like everybody else, like you see the satisfaction results on game days for us. It's like for me on scout team, it was, you know, completing more touchdowns and throwing interceptions over there with those guys, like trying to find little wins along the way and not yeah. getting too banged up after a practice was like a win. And then, yeah, yeah. The, the, but the joy was in the success we had around the season, the friends I made and living out a, a dream of mine, but that was always trying to keep that dream and perspective when you're, Cutting your teeth every single day. Yeah, man. A lot of hours. Not just the weight room, not just the practice field. Just a lot of hours you put into that thing. Hours of film, think, hours of meeting. Think about, about, dude, you want to talk about hours. 
how many random meetings in the summer at 4 p.m. <laughs> yeah. You're you're at we're the watching pool. we're watching like our eighth week like game for this next year. We're watching their whole season. <laughs> it's I'm 4 like, p.m. on a Thursday in the middle of June. Everybody that that you seconds. know that is not on your team is at the pool having a bang up time, gearing up for a great night out. And you get a group text saying, I'm getting FOMO just listening to this right now. <laughs> you, QB meeting at 4 p.m. to go and watch the eighth game that is in six months from now. Seriously. <laughs> and, and you're like, you have got to be kidding me. Or a team meeting, or the worst was getting those texts and being like, we have a compliance meeting for 30 minutes God. to sit here and listen to some squid tell me why i can't you know go on my buddy's or this guy's boat and let him buy me you know apparel and all this stuff I, I, there were times yeah, like where why my friends remember, why my dad's best friend can't buy me a dinner if we're all out together yeah i remember there was a time that we had and i, I didn't have this very often but we had somebody it was after the year i had played a little bit and um uh one of my roommates in college his uh i guess a family friend but from his town had bought me and my buddy like a weekend stay at the marriott down the hilton head was like hey just put it on the room go have fun the key will be at the door and i was like that Good is night. sick and right before we went down we had a compliance meeting about not accepting benefits and you can't do this because of your what blah 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 and just like in the back of your head thinking like, wow, I'm so cool. I'm getting ready to go do all this stuff. Right. But, um, oh my God, I can't even remember my train of thought where, where I was taking that, but the, oh, the, just the random sit down compliance, why you can't do X, Y, and Z. The worst would be like, it's yes. Yeah, summer, like having a workout and then like a segment meeting right after that. And then getting hit with like a random skills and drills or something else like random in the afternoon. And so like, the, but they'd split you up. So like, you think you have something knocked out like for the day and like you have the whole rest of your day. And then you, it'd be like the like, worst timing possible to where like you couldn't go anything except go home, take a nap and then be like, yeah, about to head back up to the facility yeah. again. It's like March. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everybody's getting ready for a St. Aunt Patty's day down at the bars. And you're like, Wow, I got a four hour spring practice and then we got gotta go watch tape after this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have a terrible <laughs> scrimmage on offense and your coach is pissed. He says, All right, we're watching film as a team or film as a unit at two o'clock today. And you have made all of these plans with all your different friends and you know about uh, terrible. Dude, they were hard pressed. Like they have like rules on how many hours they can have us in a week. Oh my god! And so they'd they they'd have uh, like all of our the GAs and student coaches. Like so, we get texts like, "Hey, like quarterback meeting at this time," and then we get there, and it's like, "Yeah, coaches can't be in," but they had all the tapes and scripts and notes like in cut ups ready for us. And like, all right, who's leading it? And then we'd have to go like sit there and like go through all of it because it wasn't labeled as like meeting time, but they'd still have us there for yeah. however long. Good stuff. Man. Wow. <laughs> yeah. You better make it. You gotta awesome. love it. You gotta love it. <laughs> <laughs>